Well, we're glad you're all here. Thank you so much for attending this LinkedIn Live webinar. I'm Josh Mayfield from Grip Security. We're going to get started here in a couple of minutes. Um, today, we're going to be talking a lot about SaaS security for modern work, and it looks a lot different than it once did. Uh, what we call SaaS, Gary, Matt, Lior, you know, what we called it in 2012 was one thing, and what SaaS is today is totally different. Uh, so we're going to get into some of these things. But Gary, first, while everybody's piling into the room here, that is one very eclectic and exciting room and background you have. Yeah, it kind of grows on you. <laughs> oh, wow. So what do we have here? you got about 20 years worth of uh, science fiction and Comic-Con and Star Wars Legos and World of Warcraft and uh, Sword Art Online, which is an anime I like, a uh, little bit of everything. Okay, now is that Millennium Falcon a sticker or a model behind you toward the corner and the ceiling? Is that the Millennium Falcon? Yeah, it's a, it's it's a model. There's actually a oh. whole fleet of ships. You know, if you look, there's a whole fleet of ships in that corner, and then I've okay. got a, and then like you know another corner over here is the Empire and all of their ships. You know, and so I've got I've got a bunch of them in this corner as well. Yeah, yeah, and you know that strikes me as uh, something similar when you're looking at like um all that sass we were talking about just the other day I kind of point here point there put the camera in the different directions and so forth segways folks segways um we'll take anything that we can take um well a lot of uh, you have piled into the room now it's still not too late to send the invite to a friend have them join as well uh, we're going to get into some of these things it's a panel discussion with some experts and i'm the talking head asking questions um but we'll go around the room real quick and give everyone an introduction to who's here and as it shows on the screen, starting from the left, going to the right, uh, Gary, you want to give us a little introduction beyond the fantastic room? Um, Gary Hayslip, I'm the uh, Chief Information Security Officer at SoftBank, uh, the Vision Fund and Vision Fund 2. Matt Stanford, my title's mislabeled there. I'm actually Gary's bodyguard, but I do most of that remote these days because of COVID. But uh, CISO at Evotech, former Nevada research director and analyst at Gardner, and a proud co-author of a couple of books with my buddy, Gary. If you. Yes. Uh, Leo, yeah, I am. Uh, if you missed it, I work for Grip. I test it here and here and there. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of the company uh, and uh, Josh's boss, which... <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Exactly. <laughs> no mistake about that. Uh, um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, and lastly, um, on this list, you know, Josh, I introduced myself at the beginning. Um, Lior is my boss and one of the most inspiring CEOs that you'll ever meet. Um, and so I'm really excited to be with this group of people today who are doing this taming of the SaaS attack surface. And to be honest with you, that's one of the things that I hear the most. Uh, it's this long, sometimes the longest unguarded border that we have. And it's not bad. It's not, you know, terrible. It's not something to avoid or block or dispense with, uh, but we do have to deal with it. Um, and so a lot of these things have turned into more like safety engineering than it is police officer or block and so forth, because these stats are not going anywhere. They, they may have creeped up on some people like, you know, the folks here saw it coming and adjusted and, and made a lot of uh, strong and successful transitions. Uh, to this new world. Um, but just, I'm curious in this concept of the, the untamed, um, the, the wild frontier that it is and, and the directions that we're going, just what are you seeing out there among your peers and in your world um, that either confirms or disconfirms some of these trends that we see? Gary, you want to go first? Yeah, let's start with Gary. Well, I mean, I, I can tell you the, um, you know, many of my friends are also Matt's friends, so we all hang out with a, a pretty eclectic community. Um, I, I mean, I, I definitely think that what we're seeing in the space, you know, because of the growth of cloud, the growth of SaaS apps being like magic mushrooms and just springing up everywhere, you know, um, I don't think there's a system on the planet that isn't dealing with something dealing with SaaS or something dealing with cloud, you know, and I'm pretty sure they're being asked by their executive teams, hey, what do you think about this? You know, hey, how hard would it be for us to transition and do this in cloud, you know? And um, and so I think all of us are at one stage or another, 
you know, in either in discovery or in the, you know, we're currently transferring over or we're, woohoo, we've made it now we're there. Now what? You know, we're, you know, but we're all dealing with. Yeah. And, it, and it's entirely a different kind of delivery model, right? The the sort of innards that we're working with when it comes to securing these services are just that, they're services. Uh, they, these aren't hard and fast things that we can go put some sort of physical something um, in between or around or squeeze or choke it out um, when it's an ethereal service that's accessed outside of any controls or pathways we operate, right? Um, and that's one, and I know you see that all the time, Matt, especially the spectrum that you get to see across all of those various clients. Um, can, can you describe that a little bit more? Is it is it a maturity thing or is it some other just a chronology everyone has to go through? Can, can you describe what that spectrum looks like across uh, your visibility? Yeah, you know, I, I, I like the beginning of the title of this, of this slide, business-led SaaS. If you think about it, what we used to call shadow IT years ago is transitionally today just enterprise value. You know, many organizations run on SaaS applications and actually don't have on-premise infrastructure by design. And the reality is, is that a lot of the old security tools that we had that were designed to give us visibility on premise fundamentally don't translate into an all SaaS or a nearly all SaaS kind of virtual environment. And so I think the way I would look at it today is there's a suite of tools out there that used to have a purpose. Their purpose is kind of questionable today. And now we have to re-architect and we have to recognize that business value today is SaaS driven. Our organization, every organization that I see is fundamentally mm -hmm. making a number of business-led decisions around which applications they choose to use, which groups of users end up using those SaaS applications, and how we get the appropriate telemetry and visibility in terms of how they're functioning and, and meeting their security and governance purposes. So I, I think this is actually a very positive thing in, in organizations such as yours are really kind of shedding light into some of those telemetry challenges that that historically have been there in the quote unquote shadow IT world, but is now just fundamentally, this is enterprise value. This is business today in my yeah. view. And you bring up a good point there, especially around the, the anthology of it, you know, the way the, the direction is going, it's almost like security and the business are on parallel tracks, um, you know, going through time, but doing different things. And I'm curious, Leo, I know that's one of the things that <clears throat> inspired you to create GRIP and to do everything that we've done. Um, but it was bringing those things together, bringing security into this trend that's already going, um, but, but bringing those closer together, at least the security being applied to all of this business led SaaS, even if it doesn't uh, go directly over into the control of security. But um, just curious about your your take on some of these things and these trends, and of course, you know uh, the reason we exist. Yeah, definitely. So I'm a I'm an extremist. I uh, look ten years to the past and I see the trend of BYOD. Who would have thought organizations would agree that the employees would use their own devices, bring their own devices into the workspace, and uh, eventually we transitioned into it, but we added security controls like MDM, like SSO and um, tools that allowed us to secure the usage of private devices. And there's, there's a few good trends those days for that as well. Um, and then if, if we think of BYOD 10 years ahead, uh, what I see is BYOA, bring your own app. Uh, users <laughs> should use the tools that let them work at the business velocity. And we as a business uh, should give them security controls that help them do that securely. Because if you think of uh, what, what people call shadow SaaS and we call business-led IT, most of those applications, they're not bad because the GLC team didn't uh, stamp them as a, as a sanctioned application. They're bad because in the context people are using them, they could end up leaking data, breaking processes, exfiltrating act, uh, data or access to production environments. And in order to do that securely, we need uh, a solution for the SaaS security control plane. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It really, and I know we'll get into some of this, that 
architectural point of view of, of changing the way we're thinking at that foundational level, uh, there's a lot of effort, let's call it, to turn the internet into little swatches called my own internet, my own network. Mm -hmm. um, it, it oftentimes uh, doesn't work because that identity is the enforcement point and it doesn't live inside these nice tidy borders um, that we have to live with. And, uh, and <clears throat> that, that brings me to a, a, another uh, topic here. And as we sort of transition on to uh, what people are doing about all of this, and, and some of the things that we, we see out there and we hear from others, I know these are some of the things that happen across these, these various trends. And, and more than anything, this group here, if we can get into that, and this is how that's relevant to me, um, because it's one of those things to look at the trend lines and the patterns and so forth, but it all comes down to, to access uh, data and ensuring that I can withstand and be resilient um, by having a strong posture. Um, and not incidentally, um, we start to piece together things that might help with that. Um, and it does become a little bit of a patchwork, again, trying to um, attempt to the best we can uh, to recreate the internet, uh, our network within the internet. Um, sometimes that leads to a lot of squiggles and lines and objects and arrows in our reference architecture uh, to try to piece it all together to get that ultimate secure outcome. Um, the other thing too is that uh, everybody's a software company now. Uh, it doesn't matter who you are, there's some sort of development aspect to it and technology lives well outside of the traditional IT organization. And so how do we handle all of this uh, and get through it all? And one of the things that's interesting to me is that the go-to for, I mean, you're talking about cloud apps, SaaS apps, what do you go to? You go to the CASB. However, um, there's a, a strong number of organizations that have no plans to try uh, doing this with CASB because they can see where they're headed to your point, Leo, that 10 year roadmap is waking up in 2030, now only eight years away um, with 80 to 85% of their apps outside of IT control. Um, and so it, CASB already has a hard time with what we have today. Um, when that SaaS attack surface changes in what it consists of and the nature of it changes, the character of it changes, um, it's even less appealing to go, to go down that route. Um, and so we have, again, this, this giant patchwork, but there's not really this, this single thing, that last bullet point, that single solution out there that can really tame all of this unguarded, untamed, unkept garden of, of SaaS apps that keeps sprouting up. Um, metaphors abound, folks. Um, but uh, I know that, that you guys have had, everyone here, various experience with these technical ways of fixing it and and also, I imagine, resonating with some of the concerns on the left there. But I'd be curious, uh, Matt, let, let's start with you. How are you seeing the, okay, that was the world, what we were just talking about. Now, okay, how are we trying to solve it? What's going to be the priority and what are we going to invest in? But how, how do you see this all playing out uh, across that spectrum you see? One, I, I, I enjoyed the diagram on the right because when I was an analyst at Gardner, I used to talk about the security world with all the applications as an inordinately complicated overlapping Venn diagram where one suite of functionality bled into another, uh, it's good to see that those trends haven't changed. You know, that's gonna be a consistent I thing. Um, I, I think at, at the heart of it, there's two fundamental issues that any security application or tool or methodology or process needs to have front and center. One is how do we control entitlements and rights and permissions within an identity context from a SaaS application? If all of us were auditors at one of the big four going in and looking at SAP or something like that, you're doing separation of duties, conflict analysis and all that stuff. So that kind of governance world, that's never going to go away with SaaS apps or on-premise. That's always there, that entitlements challenge. The data loss prevention part, I think, is absolutely critical because we have to really start thinking about how do I preclude certain types of exfiltration activity in an infrastructure stack that I don't have control over. That's an area that I think will always remain a, a high level of concern. And one area that I would respectfully add on here as well, and this is a difficult dynamic just in the SaaS space, is we've got concentration risk. So we've got in number yeah. of applications that are out there, these SaaS applications, but ultimately, you know, you can trace them all back. They hit three public clouds. They either hit AWS, 
they hit Azure or they hit GCP. So if we have a functional level issue within any of those underlying cloud fabrics, that tends to propagate out and makes that risk profile a lot larger. So I think those are trends that, you know, Lior, to your point, sir, about always thinking out a little bit, those are never going to go away. And, and new approaches, though, is what we have to be focused in on. Again, I'm, I'm a bit of a um, repeating myself on this, but the security tools and applications that we used three years ago, which isn't that much time ago, fundamentally don't work with some of the workloads and the requirements that we have today, even though conceptually we're still dealing with things like identity as a perimeter and data loss prevention. But we have to retool, we have to rethink about how we address these seminal issues. That's a that's a really fair point. And I, I'm looking at you now, Gary. Um, <laughs> I'm certain the thing is, is that, I mean, you, you're ahead of most, right? There's no secret here. That's why we invited you to be here. Um, some of these things were you know, challenges once before and and ways that you uh, had to look at the world, but then made some decisions. You guys are all SaaS, right? Can you describe that a little bit more, how, how you've done that? It's a secret. <laughs> I'm sitting there trying to think, how do I go ahead and talk all Gardnerish, like you know, like uh, like 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 Matt? I want to sound like I'm grown up. Um, <laughs> Strategery, <laughs> strategization, exactly. All right, when, 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 when you get Matt and I together, we basically rip on each other for hours. Um, the uh, you know, I honestly, I mean, for us at um, yeah, at my current employer, you know, my uh, my boss, our our CTO. He, you know, he's prior Google, prior LinkedIn, you know, worked in organizations that were heavy, you know, cloud adopters. And um, when we, when he hired me, he basically wanted someone that could do four or five different roles. <laughs> and, and we were looking at, um, and he had this, he had this idea. He had this idea that, you know, hey, we're going to be in 25 countries. We're going to have employees that are constantly traveling, you know, and they need to be able to access their data anywhere at any time. And it needs to be secure. How are we going to do that? You know, and that doesn't say on-prem infrastructure. Yeah, that says cloud, you know, with a big C, you know, and we're like, okay, how are we going to do this? And it took us about, I'd say about almost uh, a year and a half to two years to, you know, from 2019 all the way up to, you know, just before COVID. Um, yeah, yeah, 2018, 2019, it, you know, just before COVID uh, hit, we had uh, actually got it fully in place. And it was really going through the, the architecture on both the IT and the security side, realizing we were going to have to integrate both stacks and that they were going to have to go ahead and share data you know, back and forth. Um, we had large discussions on the fact that we couldn't do everything. So what were we comfortable with outsourcing and what were we comfortable with focusing you know, all of our risk resources and attention on? And then, um, and then those things that were going to be our core business services, because understand, we just don't do um, IT and cybersecurity for SBIA for the investment you know, fund. We also do it for four other funds. I mean, we kind of, you know, we actually provide security and IT services across, you know, five different entities within the SoftBank investment side of the house, um, and I'm the CISO across all of them. And so we're like, okay, we're not only going to be, you know ourselves going full cloud, we're also going to be like a service provider. What is that going to look like? And what do we need to put in place to be able to make that work? And, you know, and, and that's what we did. I mean, it, and I said it took us about two years because there was a lot of interconnected pieces that we had to put in place. And the identity piece, as as Matt went ahead and, and mentioned, you know, the identity, the identity, the access, you know, um, what data you're authorized to touch, what apps you're authorized to touch, all of that was the core piece we had to put in place, get it up, tested, make sure it worked in 25 different countries, you know, yeah. in the various offices that we had, and that it worked continuously, not just one, every once in a while. You know, um, and then once we had that in place, you know, it was just it was these dominoes, it was these pieces that we, you know, and, and each of them tied into each other, you know, to the point to where now we are a full SaaS environment, 380 SaaS apps. You know, we've got business owners identified for each app. Um, you know, we got those that are 
considered to be critical and those that are considered to be non-critical. We, you know, the business owners audit who accesses these apps. And part of my job is tracking that and verifying that. And all the critical apps, I have to collect SOC 2 letters. I have to do, you know, risk acceptance, you know, and, and we, and we, we track that. And it's, um, it is an interesting security stack because it's, you're more focused on data. You're more focused on access. You're more right. focused on, you know, your third parties and who's connecting, you know, to your network. Um, and, you know, to me, I, you know, I'm fond of always saying security is security is security. You know, most of the issues you have are relatively the same. They're just in different varieties, depending on the technology that you've employed. Since we've gone full SAF, and Matt knows this, I've worked with him on multiple, you know, projects that we were trying to work internally, um, you know, here at SoftBank. We've had, you know, just, you know, issues where we're 100% cloud, woo you know, and then we're working with a third-party company, and we're, and they're like, uh, we only do prem, on-prem and hybrid. I'm like, you guys are killing me. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to, you know, hey, I, you know, we're using Azure AD. We've got it, you know, connected to Okta. We've got Okta flows built out to all of our, you know, critical apps. You know, boom, boom, boom. We're trying to go ahead and automate it. So we submit a Jira ticket and boom, your provision or your deep provision, if you're leaving, you know, we're building these things into where it's, it's automated as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And our vendors are having to play catch up. You know, our vendors are having to beta test things because we're asking them, we're full cloud. We think it, this would be better. You know, hey, I, great. You got this dashboard with these reports, but these reports are crap. I'm not on-prem. I need yeah. this. I need this view. I need to be able to look at these things. You know, um, you know, my, my employees aren't in an office. My employees are freaking everywhere. You know, yeah. and with laptops and phones, I need to be able to see, you know, uh, what data they're accessing and what apps they're on. And, you know, it's, um, so it, it's, it's been a journey to put it in place. You know, the good thing was we had it in place. And when COVID, you know, when we went into lockdown, it was, you know, take your laptop, take your phone, go home. We just kept working. You know, we didn't, we didn't yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. And we even, and we even tracked metrics for like a year you know, tracking like the number of Zoom meetings and the number of emails and the number of just all the different, you know, stuff that was going on in the environment. Yeah. And we, it wasn't a dip. In fact, it was it was pretty much on average. It was above in some areas. You know, obviously, you know, around holiday times, it goes down because people are on vacation and they want to watch Netflix and they don't really care. <laughs> but, I... yeah. The thing about it is, is we actually tracked and we we're like, okay, you know, this works. You know, some tweaks, some new technologies. You know, we bring grip in. Holy crap, we got an extra hundred apps that we didn't know we had. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got to go look at those. You know, and um, and and like I said, you know, it, it's a it's it's a journey. And a lot of the systems I talk to who are currently on that journey, I explained to them. I said, even though I'm on, I'm on the end state, to me, it's just the beginning. It's just a different. It's just a different yeah. state now. Now I'm into, you know, how do I continue to integrate? You know, what things in my in my stack do I upgrade and do I do I make changes? You know, um, you know, my my vendors that are cutting edge that want to work with me, how do I work with them? How do we beta test? How do we improve? What what new visibilities do we need? You know, okay, I've got a CASB that does this and I'm using this other tool to do this. How do I integrate both of those together so I can see right. a whole data life cycle mm -hmm. from the beginning to the end when this data enters my environment, you know, what's coming down from the cloud? Boom, it hits my environment. My users are using it, whether it goes to storage or whether it then goes back out. I need to see that whole process. I need to see who touched it. I need to make sure they were authorized. Yeah. You know, I need to make sure that that data got stored in the right place where it was supposed to be. And the correct teams, you know, have access to it. You know, and, and all of this, you know, it's it's a um it's really a data security question. Yep. You know, and a and a, a data security problem that you have to manage and you know, and just as Leo said that to bring your own apps, I was actually jotting that down because I'm already thinking, okay, with my environment that I have, that's my next step. How do I do that? What would that yeah. look like? And and that's um that's really forward thinking. And uh the, the fact that we're even entertaining that, but just as you know, the last few years sort of snuck up on us, it might behoove us to look ahead a little bit and and get sort of imaginative. And you had mentioned that, Gary, that having that foundation, you know, allows you to entertain those kinds of things that that new architectural, a, a control plane uh, of being able to administer and govern all of this as from that data and user and identity centric position. And 
obviously everything on the right there, the Venn diagrams, Matt, uh, <laughs> it doesn't always add up to, you know, one plus one plus one equals three. Sometimes it's like one plus one plus one is three, but then there's such this headache that's involved in this lack of completeness that, you know, one plus one plus one equals you know, negative two uh, sometimes with, with difficult deployments. But Lior, I know that this is one of the things that's close to you because a lot of people might say, okay, what, what different needs to happen? Aren't there things out there? And, and it's the nature of the SAS, right? That Gary was describing as well, that really calls for a whole shift. And so um, I think that it's really um, great to hear from you when you give that perspective um, and where, um, where, where you see uh, the world going with that foundation like people like Gary have now. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks, Josh. So uh, I'll start by saying everything we saw on the right on the Venn diagram, the fact that they overlap or that they don't cover everything doesn't mean that th those are bad projects, the opposite. It's that there's no silver bullet in security. And the SaaS security problem is a mile wide and a mile deep. There's hundreds and thousands of applications and there's an entire world in each one of them. The Salesforce configuration manual is like 200 pages that uh, you need to skim through. And if you're going to build a solution that secures a single SaaS app that is Salesforce, it's going to, you can spend two years just building that. So when we think of SaaS, um, I think today the, the internet is the new network and identity is the new enforcement point. So users or the barrier for your employees or users to adopt a new application is basically a sign-up form, meaning no matter what device they use, what network they use, they enter their email and a password, then they have a new corporate app that they can start using. And over time, connect it to different environments, source code, uh, infrastructure, and data. So when we look at the challenge, the challenge is that um, companies are collecting risk and access debt. Um, and now every time there's a new user, one day you need to revoke their access. You need to make sure that they have access to the specific things that they need within the app. And you mm -hmm. collect and collect and collect different access debts, um, not by doing anything, but by your employees going around and using their own applications. Again, this is unlike five, 10 years ago, where each, um, access allocation was managed by, or access provisioning was managed by IT or security. So when we think of this need for a SaaS security control plane, we need a tool that can help us discover, know what applications are being used and who's using them and how they authenticate. Prioritize based on the risk that the application poses to my organization. And this is different between different organizations and different apps. Um, secure the applications them, themselves, which means reducing risk continuously for every app, uh, both by changing internal parameters like security configurations or external parameters like how this application is connected in my organization. Is it SSO connected? Are my users using MFA? Do they have good password hygiene? And then lastly, orchestrate um, my operations around security with my existing tool set, being my SOAR, my TPRM, Firewall, CASB, and all of the other tools. So, um, of course, this was a um, not well hidden grid pitch, but <laughs> it, it's truly really what I believe is is the challenges in SaaS today and the way I look at them when we're trying to give a solution to our customers and partners. You know, you know what I like about this is that fundamentally it's security at the pace of the business. And I think that's absolutely foundational. One of the things when, when Gary and I, along with Bill Bonney, kind of drafted the CISO desk reference guide, we really emphasize the notion of having your security program aligned to the business. When a business is SaaS first or predominantly SaaS, the speed of that, you know, you think about a traditional environment. Back when I was in the data center space, we wanted to go stand up a server. You'd order it three or four weeks later, it'd show up. You'd have to get somebody to put it into a rack. You'd have to have a network team do its work. The storage team connect the HBAs to the fabric. You'd have to go through, connect it to the back end monitoring and all this other stuff. 
versus two seconds ago, I gave a username and a password and I've got access to an app and data. What I love about this vision, Lior, is fundamentally is that you're operating at, at literally the speed of business. Security programs that can't adapt and modify and bring themselves current to that will literally ossify. They, they won't be able to preclude risk that the organization faces. And in its, uh, this first point here on, on our architectural paradigm, that is absolutely critical. If we don't modernize how we look at security, we are going to continue to do things that benefit adversaries. And we really, as an industry and as a profession, need to take pause and say, this is kind of asinine. We really do have to modernize how we look at some of these issues and take new, innovative, creative, uh, less constrained approaches that operate in a good alignment with the business. I, I think this is just absolutely foundational. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what method? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <clears throat> definitely foundational in that sense of the plans Gary has, right? To get to a world, the fact that we can even imagine it is stunning. That we can even get to the point where we can consider, why don't we do BYOA? And why, why don't we just infuse the security into the user? That way, whatever SaaS they adopt, and whenever that happens, it's, it's for a SaaS app that hasn't even been invented yet, but it's going to hit the market and be all the rage in three years. Yep. They inherit the security because it goes with the user. It goes with the identity. Um, and being able to transmit security intent, security outcome into the user and they carry it with them and take it uh, wherever they go enables that art of the possible that Gary's over here, you know, making us all well, ashamed that we're not there yet. But you know, the thing about it is, is that if you get to the point to where the user themselves is a security policy and then the data itself is a security policy and then what you run it on is really a moot point you can put it on anything <laughs> you know i mean you know and so and, and that's really where you want to get to because data right. is really what you care about what it runs on i don't really give a shit i'm looking at what comes out on the other end that we're going to go ahead and make executive decisions with that we're going to pivot the company and come out with a new process or whatever so that data and then the person themselves those are the two things i care about Right. To, Gary, to your point, you know, there's another CISO that we know in our local community. And, and I remember having a conversation with him. This was probably three or four years ago. And he goes, my job is not to sit there and select productivity tools for business units within this enterprise. You know, that's an asinine thing to be doing. My job is to make sure that the business units have the tools they need to go out and gener generate enterprise value. So whether an organization is using X, Y, or Z collaborative tool or file sharing tool or whatever is almost irrelevant, assuming that it is appropriately governed and controlled, but you've got to embed that governing and control fabric, if you will, into something that isn't kind of obstructive, interruptive, that, that creates fiction for the, organize, for the organization. Yeah, well said, well said. And, and one of the things that... Um, as we're sort of taking this, you know, what are the implications of an architectural shift? One of them that, that stands out to me is the ability to unify everything because right now it's, okay, well, this is my app and this is core IT or this is a business-wide thing uh, type of SaaS, but that's yours. It's us and them and you know, mm -hmm. you're on your own, but I kind of want oversight, but I don't want responsibility. It's this strange tension, right? Um, because the, it isn't unified. It isn't all in one place. And and when we have had more of a you know a, a control plane mindset shift, we can start to unify these two sides that are both um, equally important. One is a little bit more concentrated and more you know again untamed when it comes to the right side there on the the business led SaaS. Um, but you know Lior touched on it when it comes to those four principal things. First, you got to know where it all is before you can start to stitch it together. Second yep. is you know, what's relevant to me. And this is where you know, the, the TPRM thing so is such a disappointment sometimes. Um, not, not anything you know, against it. You can just only factor into a score the components that you put into your formula. Um, so you could go off looking for those aspects that you want to put into your formula, which doesn't necessarily um, tell you the, the real world relevant risk um, to you. 
Um, instead, it's more of a sterile, you know, fact check survey kinds of things. Um, but but how is it being used? What's currently there to remediate any uh, access control or or permission um, that dangles after the uh, the access should be revoked and so forth? And some of those things can become difficult uh, to know what's you know what's one side or the other. Offboarding, oh goodness. Um, I think with the Twitter uh, or the Twilio, sorry, the, the Twilio uh, compromise uh, back in August, uh, that's one of the people that got the smishing message was a former employee who, again, in some data role, in some uh, uh, directory, in some app, you know, is a part of it and gets a gets a message and gets targeted and you know, click bang into into the systems. Things like that can happen. Um, we also saw with, uh, you know, Ma MailChimp and their CEO stepping down um, after that compromise and its proliferation, you know, this, this hub and spoke that looks eerily similar to Sunburst, <laughs> to Microsoft Exchange uh, back in the first part of 2021. Some of those things, you know, compromise here and then spread to all the spokes. And there's nothing more hubbed and spoke, like you mentioned earlier, Matt, than, uh, than SaaS. Um, when it comes to that concentration of risk that happens. And if it can't be unified, then those concentrations can't be discovered. And those implications of one compromise here in the chain reaction downstream, and since every company is, an, is a software company now, it has implications on our customers and even the things that we do to drive revenue, right? Um, and what we've noticed is, you know, those overlapping circles sort of come up short in that ability to to unify some of these things uh, because it, again, it, it's starting from a position of network thinking um, that point solution point type thinking uh, a bias toward seek and destroy this thing that actually is flourishing and driving value to your point that, um, and it doesn't seem to be a problem for people like Gary um, to be able to, to go in this direction uh, and, and ultimately to get to a point where, um, the the whole life cycle can be maintained, um, and then we can possibly get into that uh, that bigger world and so forth. But uh, when when you look at some of these things that that you've gone through, um, Gary, Matt, and we'll kind of wrap up here with some of the the final thoughts and and what you've done to be successful. Are there any of the different things uh, out there that you would have tried or should have tried or, or you do something in another way uh, to have a different kind of impact? Because uh, I know a lot of people are just starting this journey and probably want to have that same success. Gary, would you like to go? <laughs> um, you know, I think some of the biggest things is it just kind of is realizing like, I mean, for us, you know, IT and, uh, and cyber, we work very close together. Our teams do. You know, and we're and we're really you know integrated together, and uh, and I kind of have deputized probably most of the network team, you know, to be part of to be part of this the the security team. Um, but I think you know the big thing is you know you're going to need both IT and cyber to work together. Um, you really need to understand um, the various business units within the org and what data they're using, what apps they're using, and why. You know, and, you know, and we actually put a whole process in place to where, you know, the, the SaaS apps that you're going to be implementing, the stuff that you're going to be using within the organization is very fluid. And you just need to accept that. You know, so you need to put a process in place to where um, users feel comfortable bringing to you, hey, we want to use this new app. You know, the, you know this team needs this or you know, um, we've got a third party that we're, you know, partnered with. We've got a contract with them. They're using this application. We want to use it too. You know, they need to be comfortable and trust you, bring it to you. There should be a review process to where you can go through it. And then you can take a look at, you know, any residual risks or issues with it, what type of new data it might create, or what changes to current data it might create. Is there any regulatory issues that you now are inheriting, you know, because of this app or not? You know, and sometimes you need to put this in place and just, you know, and once you do that and the team kind of builds in the muscle memory of working together, of managing these apps and understanding how data is used within the organization, um, this whole journey actually becomes pretty easy. It's then just, you know, putting your controls in place so that you understand what you need to monitor, 
you know, what you need to log, how you're going to do incident response, how you're going to investigate. The big thing I, I go ahead and I tell people when you're full cloud is that you're not going to be able to do it yourself. You're going to have to have other people to help you. You know, you're not going to be able to do everything. So be willing to go ahead and let some stuff get outsourced. It's just, it's better for the organization, you know, and, um, and so it's just, just be comfortable with that. But that's cloud. That's just the way it is. You, know, you can't hold on to it like when you used to have your own data center and all your own hardware and everything else. I mean, you know, and you're going to find when you go that route, you don't need as big as teams as you used to have. You know, um, you'll find that you're extremely flexible. You'll find that when you're doing incident response and you're dealing with an incident, um, the incidents honestly aren't as impacting as on-prem ones are, and you can actually resolve them quicker. You know, um, so it's just it's just things like that that I, you know, I go ahead and I tell people, don't be scared of it. Be willing to go ahead and step in and do it. Be willing to go ahead and talk to the community, talk to your peers, you know, and other organizations that are already doing it. So you can kind of exchange, you know, lessons learned and, and you're going to be okay. It, it's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's actually a, I look at it as a, as a growth yeah. thing for yourself professionally and for your business. You, you know, one thing, it's it's a great question because it makes you take pause and think a little bit. And and I would say as a profession, we've been slow to understand the business implications of SaaS for our organizations. And, and I think there's a couple of areas where this spills through, like companies that do their due diligence of XYZ company or ABC company. Their due diligence questionnaires presuppose that the company that they're evaluating has on-premise infrastructure. And, and Gary, I'm sure you go through this all the time, where if you get a questionnaire, you're looking at this and you go, you know, this questionnaire must have been written circa 1985 when I graduated from high school, because it certainly doesn't reflect a modern business in, in how it drives enterprise value. So I think there's a challenge there as a profession, especially on the governance and third-party risk management side that the industry needs to catch up very quickly. And, and I think we also see this, frankly, although kind of a, a topic for another day, is relative to like API security. APIs now fundamentally are some of the most important threat vectors that we have to think through, as well as identities. And I think, you know, the last point here, um, and I love what you guys are doing in this space, Identity is something we should, as a profession, should have been front and center on 15 years ago and really, really thinking through the implications. Lior, to your point, sir, you know, thinking through, like, what does BYOD really mean? You know, what will BYOD mean in the future where it's bring your own app? It could be BYOD, bring your own data. You're a data scientist and you've got your own uh, tokenized data or data sets that you work with no matter where you go. There's a number of these implications that as a profession, we have to be more closely aligned to the business models that purportedly were there to protect and, and help make more resilient. So, so that would be kind of what I would uh, what I would share with this. I will add just a, a final point because I have to respond to a lot of the due diligence requests that come at our organization. I love the fact that we're SaaS heavy. You know, it makes our ability to control and secure our environment orders a magnitude much easier than if I had traditional data centers with, you know, traditional server farms and hypervisors and all of that digital detritus that comes with managing a lot of infrastructure. A lot of that goes away in this world and it, and it simplifies that. The problem is we got to get the rest of the industry to understand there are businesses out there that literally do not have any application that they physically control. Right. Yeah, it's for us, uh, you know, we get the vendor questionnaires that ask, how do you um, maintain security for your server, server rooms and everyone that comes in? It's like, N.A. Exactly. <laughs> N.A. Uh, I, I, although I would say N.A. with an explanation. It's always critical to inform whoever's the reader. Yeah, no, no servers in the yeah. cloud. Uh, but it makes <laughs> things easier. I think, um, Josh, I know uh, you have a last question, but for my side, um, the way SaaS change how the threat landscape looks like is that uh, hackers don't break in, they log in. So they don't need to be in your network. All they need is the username and a password that they somehow got 
and to type it in the browser where there's no monitoring, no security tools, uh, and it gets them to your sensitive assets like source code, data, um, IT configurations, and other other things. Yeah, a whole lot of things that that are the production environment or control the production environment, uh, control the transactions and the way that we run HR, finance, supply chains, you know, all of these various SaaS applications and that SaaS on SaaS kind of uh, chain reaction, again, that we saw in late August um, with some of the things that, that came out of you know, some SaaS email organizations compromised and then the downstream effects of, of then what, what that then gave access to. And I know it's hard to take the, uh, the passwords away from people, but you're right, Lior, there are um, passwords a, a plenty out there. Uh, according to some of the research by, uh, by Okta even, uh, you know, they're trying to eliminate as many passwords as they can with a SAML, but uh, 109, is the average number of duplicate passwords that users have <laughs> in price. So um, everything from you know their uh, their personal email, their work email, their personal um, LinkedIn, their Slack account, and also and using all of these various same username, password, their work email, and just the same password that they didn't duplicate everywhere. Well, guess what I can do? Again, to your point, I can just log in, right? I don't have to break in, but I find the password over here for that thing you have. I can do a quick scan of your various applications that you're using and I can, dumb luck, uh, go ahead and apply it in one of those places and chances are I'm going to be right in. Even this, this is why credential the original stuffing one, is the thing I compromised. Yeah. Yeah. I so, mean, this is why um, credential stuffing is so powerful these days. <laughs> oh, yeah. And and I do want to just, um, you know, in, in close here. And again, thanks everybody for being uh, a part of the LinkedIn live event. As you can see, uh, it's a friendly panel of people that this is probably how the conversation would have gone if we weren't recording uh, and, and weren't putting this on LinkedIn, just because uh, this is when the few of us get together, these are the kinds of things we talk about. Um, but I do want to give everybody just sort of a, a final word of wisdom or insight or something that you can share. Um, the, the best part about being in the security community is that community aspect. We share a lot, especially insights, wisdom, um, uh, trade secrets, hacks, uh, ways that we've gone about uh, being successful. And so I just want to leave it, uh, one final uh, parting thought for everyone here. Any insight or or something you want to share with the group here that's on the call before we go? We have to defer uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there. I, I will just say, you know, I'm inordinately inspired by the innovation that we're seeing. Um, that innovation though is inspiring on both sides. It's, it's what our adversaries and the threat actors are doing to compromise mm -hmm. our environments. And it's what you know technologists and innovators like Lior, you and Josh and your extended team are doing to keep pace with that and find innovative approaches to mitigating these risks. So I, I think collaboration to your point, Josh, is critical. And I love the fact that we are in a profession where collaboration is championed and and welcomed. Gary, any parting thoughts? I mean, uh, like I said, I pretty much go with, uh, with with what Matt was saying. I mean, the um, you know, I have found in my, I mean, I'm in my fifth role as a CISO right now, and I continually find um, the more I interact with peers, it's just being a part of a community and being yeah. able to work together, being able to share information together. Um, you know, as diverse as it is, and just as electric as it is, all the, the various people that you know that, that work together, being able to share that kind of information and help each other, and and also having a willingness to understand that there is really no one set you have to do it this way. You know, yeah. it's extremely flexible. There's always different ways to approach issues, and that's what you have a community for. Is you know, hey, you may do it this way, but my environment, my business, we're going to do it this way. You know. Right. Yeah, so uh, if I wasn't greedy and uh, if I didn't cut you off and said, hackers don't break in, they log in, I would have the perfect <laughs> one line yeah. to finish the, the webinar with. <laughs> but this is what you get for, for being rude. Um, yeah. no. So I, I'll add that 
so b before before Grippa used to be a, a venture capitalist uh, investing in security, I think it's important for everyone to stay up to date with new new challenges, new risks, and new tech. Uh, because the attackers will def definitely do it. They're always two steps ahead, mm -hmm. and uh, we need to make sure we don't stay far behind. So um, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. And with and with uh, push button tools that they can slap together in a weekend, from um, so much uh, tooling and and malicious uh, infrastructure and kits available. Um, and everything as a service and the ransomware as a service and so forth. Um, it, you know, it's, there's a lot of DIY that can be done very quickly against, again, a very large part that's unguarded in the attack surface. Um, that's probably the, the one parting thought I would give to folks is that um, it's good. It's right. It's strong for the business. It's just unguarded, um, but we can change that. We can put safeguards in place and, um, we don't have to block, tackle, seek, and destroy. We can just think like safety engineers. And what would we do to make the building where people are going to operate, this building called SAS, how do I make it safe, no matter which floor they go to? Um, so again, I uh, want to thank everybody for being here and being a part of this. Um, Matt, Gary, love being able to spend time with you again. And uh, Gary, I really appreciate uh, your willingness to be very entertaining uh, for the folks here today. And uh, with that, We'll see you all later and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Take yeah. care. Bye-bye.